forget that Jesus didn't just pop out of his mother, mother's belly knowing who he was and understanding his role as Messiah. But you know what the scriptures tell us? Actually, right there in the Gospel of Luke, the, the Gospel writer tells us something about Jesus as he's growing up. It doesn't tell us much about Jesus growing up years and his young adult years, but it does say this about it. It says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. Jesus grew in wisdom and his stature. He, he grew in stature in the sense that, that he started out as a baby and, and he began to grow and, and at certain points he learned how to do, do things that he didn't know how to do before. He, he didn't come right out of his mama's belly walking. Right? He had to learn how to walk. He, he probably fell at certain times on his way to learning how to walk. He had to learn how to do things around his, his father's carpentry shop that and maybe had some mistakes along the way. Think about this. As a human being, Jesus had to grow in wisdom. He had to learn things just like all of us do. And yet at the same time, all of that learning was directing him towards a fuller and, and complete picture of who he was as the Son of God and as the Messiah. And that culmination is found in his baptism. You see, Jesus, as he's growing up and into his adult, early adult years, bit by bit, bit is, is beginning to put together this puzzle of who he is. You know, imagine going through your early life and, and coming to the conclusion that you are the Messiah. Pretty amazing, huh? You, 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 would you resist that? I know I would. But bit by bit, it keeps being reinforced to him. Jesus, you're not going to be a carpenter your whole life. I've got bigger and better plans for you than that. I've got something that will blow your mind. Yet you need to figure out how you're going to accept that and fulfill that. And Jesus keeps... Uh, having to renegotiate that within himself. Remember, for example, at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he has this horrible thing coming to him in the, in the, in the death of, of the cross, and, and he prays to, to God, and he, and he kind of starts to, to, to negotiate a little bit with God. He says, Lord, if there's some way that I can accomplish what you need to accomplish through me that doesn't involve the suffering that I'm supposed to go under. Lord, let this cup pass from me. Right? Isn't that kind of a negotiating? Lord, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not eager to go through this. I, I want you to maybe see if there's some other way. But, but then he ends it with saying, nevertheless, not my will but your will be done. And he subsumes his own desires as a human into the divine desires and accepts where he needs to go from there. But there's this whole thing going along that as he's growing up, he's getting these hints and these clues. You are meant for something unique and special. And he's getting more and more of an idea of that as time goes along. And then he comes to his baptism. And by this time, he's just this close to getting it fully. And it's all sealed when he comes up from the baptismal waters. And the voice says to him, That's right. You're my son, with whom I am well pleased. All of this stuff that's been leading up to this he comes to this. So now you know who you are, and, 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 and at the same time that that's happening, the Holy Spirit comes down and, and rests on him, and, and so it's no wonder that when we begin the story of Jesus' uh, time in the wilderness, it says, full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He is full of the Spirit. It's a, a mountaintop experience for Jesus. He now knows fully who he is. He's the Son of God with whom the Father is well pleased. 
Now, having had that experience, he might think, well, that was the perfect time to go out and begin his earthly ministry. But the Holy Spirit has other ideas. In fact, it says to him that when he, right after this high mountaintop experience, he doesn't go out to be in ministry, but the Holy Spirit leads him into this time into the wilderness. Uh, in, in Mark, when Mark tells this story, it says that the, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. I don't mean he put him in a car and dropped him off. <laughs> he, he drove him to the wilderness. That means that, that, that maybe Jesus, again, kind of like in the Garden of Gethsemane, wasn't so anxious to God. It's, it's lonely out there. Yeah, I got a lot to think about, but it's kind of lonely, and, and I don't want, and you don't want me to eat. But the Spirit drives him out in the wilderness, and, and, and while in Luke it says that while he was out in the wilderness, he was tempted. Uh, Matthew says he was sent out into the, or drove and driven or led out to the wilderness to be tempted. In other words, the whole purpose of his going out into the wilderness was to face this temptation. Now, why would the Holy Spirit do that? Doesn't seem like a very nice thing to do. But, and, and in fact, you know, later on, Jesus tells us when he teaches his disciples to pray, he says, pray, lead me not into temptation. And yet here, the Holy Spirit is leading him right into temptation. The way that I would understand this and invite you to think about it is to say that there was a purpose for this going into the wilderness, and that was for Jesus to pass the test that he needed to pass in order to be able to go out into ministry. There had to be some things that he became absolutely clear about before he would go out into ministry. And, 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 and in that sense, this was a time of, of, of uh, being tried by fire and coming out more stronger and more full of growth and the wisdom <laughs> that he needed. And, 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 and so we want to take a look at the ways in which he was tempted. Because I think that tells us why it was so important for him to have this refining experience. He needs to be tested. He needs to be sifted like we. He needs to be tried by fire. Now, we need to pay attention, though, to what the nature of that testing is. Jesus knows without a doubt who he is. He knows that he is the Son of God, the Beloved, with whom the Father is well pleased. But now he needs to get a little clearer on what the nature of the power that that has been bestowed upon him as the Son of God. And it's exactly around that whole issue of what kind of power is Jesus going to exhibit and display that the devil tempts him. That's exactly how the devil chooses to mess with him, trying to get him to misuse his power. And we're, we're given the details of three different strategies used by the devil to try to get Jesus to mess up. And, and all three of them involve how he is going to use his power. And, and, and we understand how important this notion of how power is used because we know how easy it is for power to be abused. Amen? Amen. And we look at our leaders and we see them abusing the power and authority that they have all the time. Our Congress right now is divided with some folks on all sides of the, either side of the aisle saying, gosh, our, our president is using his power to declare an emergency in, in, a, in a way that isn't right. Many of them are saying, and then others are saying yes, and they're, and they're fighting over this. But the, the point is that some of our folks are saying, the president is abusing his power. And we all perhaps have an experience of, of seeing somebody, even just in our own lives, who, when they get a certain amount of power, that power goes to their heads. You know, maybe you've had a boss who, with the power that that boss has, 
makes things so difficult and, and unfair for people or are miserable when he could actually be using his power to help people. Or maybe you have seen a teacher who, who inappropriately belittles or, or ashames a, 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 a child and, and uses their power to beat folks down rather than to lift them up. Or, or, or maybe we've had parents who, God forbid that we would do this, but parents who have abused the power that they have to, to grind a child down or even abuse them and traumatize them. And, and, and closer to the situation that Jesus is facing, we've, we've seen, Lord have mercy, religious leaders abuse their power in all sorts of ways. Power is a hard thing for us human beings to handle well. And there are many, many more ways to abuse power than there are to use power in a positive way. Power in itself isn't bad. It's a matter of how we use that power. And the devil wanted to get Jesus to misuse his power for his own glorification rather than to serve others. Because he knows that power is easy to abuse. So the devil tries to tempt Jesus in that way, trying to get him to use his power. Now, it's interesting. Notice that the devil starts two of the three temptations with the words, if you are the Son of God. Now, some people would say, oh, well, that's the devil trying to get him to doubt whether he's the Son of God. I'm not sure that that's it. I think it's more like the devil says, okay, that's been established. You're the Son of God, and since you are the Son of God, use your power in this way, right? They say to Jesus, you've struck it rich. You have been given incredible power, and now you can use all of this power to make things easier for yourself, to amass power over others, and to guarantee your own personal safety. The first temptation, uh, or if, or, or since you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread, break the fast that you have committed yourself to, and become comfortable, and you can use the power to cut, set things up for yourself in a really nice way. Bread anytime you want, and more. The second temptation the devil says, I will help you become the most powerful leader in the world. But, but in order for that to happen, and, and you'll get all the perks that go along with it, all of the power over people to get them to do exactly what you want to do, to get them to fall down before you, but you'll have to fall down to me first. You'll have to make some basic compromises about who you are. And the third temptation. If or, or since you are the Son of God and can command angels to protect you, why not throw yourself off the highest point of the temple and show everybody that God has your back and nobody can do anything to stop you? Comfort, power, safety. You can use your status, the devil tells him as the Son of God, to accumulate all of these. Isn't that wonderful? And had Jesus given in to any of these temptations, I've got to tell you, brothers and sisters, that this was a possibility. Jesus had a free will. That was part of his being human. But if he had given in to any of this, his ministry would have been ruined. And he would have joined the ranks of all the other spiritual leaders who had abused their power rather than serve people. But thank God we know that through the power of the Holy Spirit Jesus passed his test and, and came out stronger than when he came in. And in the process we see that Jesus' resistance to this kind of power that the devil wanted to give him is, is in the end saying a bold no to power as it is usually understood. Power to dominate, power to control, power that is idolatrous and, and demonically ideological, power that insists on one's own way and one's own, own power. And in saying no to that sort of power, Jesus fulfills 
his identity as a leader of principle, a leader who serves, a leader who practices power with rather than power over, a leader who shares his power and empowers other people to live into the abundant life that Jesus wants to give everyone. The end result of his being tempted is that Jesus clarifies not only that he is the powerful son of God, but what sort of power he is intended to exercise as the Messiah and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, this all applies to us. This isn't just an experience that Jesus had, although it was, and it's an important one, but it's, it's something that we need to learn from as well. We are not the Messiah, but we are children of God. Amen? Amen. That is our identity, just as the, Jesus' identity was as the unique Son of God. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I am a child of God. It's important for us to remember that because when you are a child of God, there's all sorts of wonderful things that go along with it. There's, there's power that comes from being a child of God. Amen? There's a power that comes from knowing that you are loved by God no matter what. There's a power that comes from knowing your sins are forgiven. There's a power that comes from knowing that the very Spirit of God dwells in you. And the very same things that Jesus did in his life, by the power of that Spirit, by the grace of God, we can do as well. Amen? This is all wonderful, isn't it? To be a child of God. Aren't you glad that you are a child of God this morning? And we need to remember that. But we also need to remember why. And what it is to be a child. And to, to understand that it's not all about to us. You see, see, sometimes this child of God language gets abused and, and distorted by preachers. I think you might know some of the preachers I'm talking about. These are the preachers who tell you that you are, you're a child of the king. And, and because you're a child of the king, you ought to have the best of everything. That you're a royalty. And that it's all about that God wants to pour these riches upon you. And, and, and for them, it almost seems that, that following Jesus is the road to get rich. The road to get rich. Amen. That, that, that if you just do the things you're supposed to do, and you have enough faith, and you give enough money to the man of God, then, then you're going to get rich too. And, and, and Jesus is great for helping you to get rich. Right? Because right. you're a child of the king. Amen? So, so I just got through saying all, all the wonderful things that it is about being a child of God, but then these folks go a little bit further and say, well, you're, you're, you're not the child of the God who became a human being who left his throne and, and gave up all of the things that were related to being God so that he could serve humanity. No, you're the kind of God, child of the king who, who kills people who don't do what they want them to do, who, who makes sure that they get rich, even if that means other people get poor. And so they say, well, you know, if you don't have a car you want, go give money to the man of God, you'll get your car. If you don't want, if you don't have the the, the the, the, the house you want to live, give your money to the man of God, go get that house. If you, if you don't have what the clothes that you want to wear, and you don't look the way you want to look, give your money to the man of God, and, 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 and all of this stuff will come your way. Amen? You've heard this. And this is a distortion. This is a distortion of the gospel. And it's exactly the kind of thing that, that Jesus said, no, we do not live by bread alone. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And, 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 we, and we see this distortion. But we see this also in the less obvious but still distorted message that tells that, us that being a Christian is only or primarily about going to heaven. Now I'm all for going to heaven. Amen? Amen. <laughs> But you know, if all that was going to happen for you when you become a Christian is that you can look forward to going to heaven, why doesn't God just take us up right then and there? 
when we confess as Jesus as Lord. Amen? Amen? No, he's got something else for you and I to do while we are here. And you know, it isn't so much that we need to get to heaven, but that heaven needs to get into us. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? Heaven needs to come into us so that we can spread heaven out into the world. You know, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we pray that, we might not realize it, but what we're saying is, Lord, I need you to use me. I want you to use me to bring more heaven into this earth because so many people are living in a hellish existence. And that's what we have to work on now. Yeah, we'll get to heaven by and by, and that's great. I can't wait. But I know I have some things to do, and I that you all have some things to do. And that's why the Holy Spirit comes, not only so that we can resist temptation, but so that we can have the power that we need power. not to get rich, yeah. not to have it just be me and Jesus, but so that we can follow Jesus with the path of serving, mm -hmm. and reaching out to the least, the last, and the last. You see, see, we, we have to understand the fullness of what it means that our identity is as children of God. And understand the distortions and the temptations because, you know, the, the devil is given the same message he gave to Jesus through some of these preachers. We need to resist them. So like all preachers, uh, false teachers, the, the prosperity creatures, the me and Jesus creatures, and all, all, all these false creatures, they get a few things right. And you wouldn't listen to them if they didn't get some things right. Yes, you are a child. Yes, you are a child of the king. Yes, Jesus is your brother. Yes, you have dignity and value and worth and, of course, power. There are lots of things in this life that beat us down and make us feel small and powerless and worthless. And so it is critical that we reinforce this message that as a child of God, you are somebody. That you have value. That you have purpose. And worth. And, and more power than you realize. And, and all of this is the case because you are a child of God by the grace of God. Like I said, the power that comes from being related to God in this way is intended for something much deeper, much more significant than just your own little word. It's interesting to note that Luke makes sure to point out that as Jesus goes out into the wilderness, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's another attribute of being a child of God, that we are filled with God's Spirit, amen? Amen. And while it is hard to resist the wiles of the devil, hard to resist the sort of power that the world loves and values, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can, as the scriptures tell us, resist the devil, and he will flee. Just like he did with Jesus. He'll come back just like he did with Jesus, but he will flee. We don't do this on our own any more than Jesus in his own power. The power to resist is not just our, our own willpower, uh, thank goodness. There's more to it than that. It is the power of God working in us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus was able to resist because he was full of the Holy Spirit. But guess what? So are we. We have that same promise from Jesus. That not only would he be filled with the Spirit, but what did he say on uh, near leading up to the day of Pentecost there in Acts? He says, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the purpose for that power, he says, is to be a witness. To witness to all the goodness and glory of God in word and in action to the ends of the earth. We have power, brothers and sisters but it's power for others and service to others. Brothers and sisters, this issue of identity is critical. Don't let anybody 
or anything steal your identity. No one can take that identity from you. No human, no government, no vote of the general conference, not even all the powers of evil aligned against us. You are a child of God. Stand strong in your identity. But just as important, don't let anyone or anything distort that identity. You are a child of God who is blessed to be a blessing. You are a child who is learning that to be great in the kingdom of God is to be the servant of all. You are a child of God that when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, you say, yes, Lord, I will do it, no matter where it takes me. You are a child of God who has been filled by the Holy Spirit and have received power from on high. Not so you can build your own little temp empire, but so you can build the kingdom of God up by serving the least and the last and the lost and by witnessing to the goodness of God to the ends of the earth. So again, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I am a child of God. And then turn to your other neighbor if you've got one and tell them, I have the power of the Holy Spirit. I have the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you go out of here today, know that you're somewhere along the line going to be tempted. But through that same power that allowed Jesus to go through that temptation unscathed, we have the power to live out that beautiful and wonderful identity. Children, 